Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special Voices presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and please welcome Mr. Todd Suleika. Todd is a HVCC alumnus, a foundation board member, a nationally recognized investment specialist, and the founder and managing director of the Merrill Lynch Wealth Management Office in Clifton Park. Joining Todd on stage today are student representatives of the History Making Personal Finance and Investment Club. These students are Lucas, Marcus, Dean, and Micah. And I am your host today, Kaylee Carino. Our conversation today is a question and answer discussion. The students on stage will ask questions which will be of interest to everyone who is considering their next steps in investing. If time allows, we will take questions from the audience. So please make your way over to Professor Sternard, who has a microphone, for you to ask your questions over there. Without further ado, let us put our hands together for Todd Suleika. Well, thank you. Appreciate being here. Uh, Joe and I go back a long way. So Joe, thanks for the invite. I sure appreciate you being here, sir. Absolutely, and hopefully today is an interactive session. You got some great young talent on the stage here with me. I feel honored to be on with you guys. So um, where do you want to get started? I think first question, okay. Dean, let's do it. All right, so Ms. Shaleka, I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I say that everyone who knows you, it's an honor to have you here, but I think it'd be criminal to assume that everyone here actually knows who you are. So I'd like to start off our chat by talking about yourself, your backgrounds, uh, where you work, anything you think of about yourself to let people know who you are. Yeah, great question. And you know, one of the things that uh, I'll start by saying, when we work with individual clients, we never answer that question until the end. And, and there's a reason for it right? It's about them. And you got to keep that part in mind. So I'm going to flip the script a little bit since you asked. I'll give you just a little bit of history, which is uh, my wife's here with me as well. Uh, high school sweethearts. She still hangs around with me. So something must be going okay. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in Schenectady, went to Niskuna High School, came to Hudson Valley. And Hudson Valley was interesting for me because I was not going to attend college. I had zero desire. I was a reasonably good high school athlete and a reasonably average high school student. Maybe that might even be a little bit of exaggeration there on the second part. <laughs> and uh, I remember my dad came to me one day and he said, son, go to Hudson Valley and try this out. And I said, no, dad, I got a good job. I'm making good money and I don't need, I don't need college. And he said, just give it a try. Keep your job, keep working, give it a shot. And let me tell you, it was the best advice I ever got. So I came here for two years, commuted, I uh, got a degree in the business school, transferred to SUNY Albany, finished up SUNY Albany, and here we are. It kind of feels a little eerily like today. I graduated 1992. Uh, we were in a recession. Now, we are not technically in a recession today, but it feels like one. It's certainly a hiring recession in a lot of formats, especially in finance. So you know, I graduate. I, I lived at home for four years, uh, paid 100% of my own tuition through working, through college, got done and looked around and thought, what the hell did I do all this for? Right, here I am. I was working at the Desmond in, uh, in Albany, right by the airport, now the Crown Plaza, and I was still working at the Desmond, right by the airport. Uh, and I'm like, well, that was a good four years. Um, and it took me three more years to finally break into the industry. And I'm sure a lot of people know ACO, local firm, where Joe and I actually met. We both, we both hung our shingle there for a while. And I, uh, it, it, the story on, on how I got to ACO, and it's funny, we were talking about this earlier about connections and you know, are you gonna make it in the industry? Um, and, and here's a myth. You can make it in the industry, any industry, without any connections. You do not have to have someone in your family or an uncle or a, a best friend who's wildly successful that's gonna put their arm around you. Anybody can make it in this industry. I'm not bragging about it, but I had zero connections. I was the wealthiest of all my friends because I didn't owe any money. That was the, my net worth was zero. Theirs was all negative. Uh, so I'm working at the hotel one day and the president of ACO is there and he's hosting a, a big event. And I come up to him, his name's Barry Hammerlin, still lives in the area. And I said, Barry, can I talk to you for a minute? 
And he said, yeah, what are we out of shrimp? And I said, no, no, the shrimp's fine, shrimp's flowing. I said, I'd like to talk to you about a career. One other thing I'll throw out, words matter. Words matter a lot. What you say can be interpreted so many different ways. I didn't say I wanna to talk to you about a job. I wanna to talk to you about a career. There's a huge difference. Jobs are temporary. Careers are permanent. And he said, why would I hire you? You're a banquet manager at a hotel. And you gotta have your elevator pitch, right? And mine was simple. I said, well, I'm the hardest working guy you've ever met, and I'm willing to prove it to you if you give me a chance. I said, I will outwork anyone you've ever hired in your entire career. I don't have the skill, but I have the will. And the president of ACO looked at me in my suit with probably stains all over me, wheeling out coffee and shrimp, and he said, come in Monday. And that's how I got hired in the industry. And then I spent 10 years at ACO. We built a, a retail asset management division there. Retail meaning high net worth clients. Typically somewhere between one and 10 million is our typical engagement. And we built that business up. Uh, ACO was acquired in 2006, or I'm sorry, 2004 by Goldman Sachs. And in 2006, myself and a few of my teammates left and joined Merrill Lynch. It was simply a better home for us for our type of business. Uh, at that point, we had about 400 million in assets that we managed. And in the last 17 years, we're now at 2.3 billion in retail assets right here in upstate New York. Uh, I've got six kids, one great partner over there in the front row, and uh, I run a team of 14 people. So that's, that's my history. That's a wonderful in-depth answer, Todd, so thank you very much for that. And now I'd like to pass it over to my associate, Marcus. Thank you. Um, when we talk about uh, first-time investors, they often get afraid or curious on how they should invest. Uh, what, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting in the stock market? Yeah, it, 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 Marcus, that's a great question, and I'll tell you why. If you, if you do something and it doesn't work well, you end up with behavioral bias, right? I invest in the stock market and I lose money. I go to the casino and I put it all on black and it spins black, and now I'm like, oh, look at this, look at how smart I am. Now all of a sudden I'm an expert at roulette. You're not, right? The casino is beautiful for a reason. It's that zero and double zero on the roulette wheel. Right? That's why it's a beautiful place to be for the owner. So what I would encourage people when you think about starting out is don't let behavioral bias get in the way of a good long-term plan. And let's just give you a simple, a simple math. All right, Money doubles every 10 years. That is simple math. How many people here know the rule of 72? A couple. All right, the investment club guy. I see some in the audience. The rule of 72 is simple. If you take the number 72 and your divisor is your rate of return, it tells you how long it takes your money to double. So if I could earn 10% per year, which by the way, that number gets floated out, that's not a good barometer for the long-term return of risk assets, stocks in, in specifically. A better number is more like eight. But just think about 10. If I could earn 10%, 10 goes into 72, 7.2 times, my money will double every 7.2 years. So if I can earn a more reasonable rate of return, let's say seven to eight percent, and you know I look around and, and Marcus, how old are you? Uh, Twenty-one. All right. So at twenty-one years old, if you had ten thousand dollars, and you could double it every ten years, ten becomes twenty at thirty-one, becomes forty at forty-one, becomes eighty at fifty-one, and becomes one hundred and sixty thousand at sixty-one. Now you hit the bid and you say I'm retired. Well, one hundred sixty thousand is not going to purchase at your age 61 would all purchase today, but it still probably has purchasing power of well in excess of 100 grand from the 10 that you started with. That's the mentality that the best investors have. Turn off the noise and look at the signals, right? The noise is CNBC. The noise is Jim Cramer. Not to bust on Jim Cramer, but he used to run a hedge fund. We all know hedge fund managers make a ton of money. Why is Cramer now on TV? because his hedge fund sucked. It failed miserably. Uh, when Kramer said Buffett lost his way in 2000, he's old, he doesn't know what he's doing anymore, value stocks are dead, he doesn't get it. Seven of his top 10 picks went to zero, right? And what did Buffett do? He made money. He's one of the richest guys in the world. So 
When you think about starting out, the first place I would think about starting out is with my own personal attitude, which is when I invest money, it needs to have a long duration. You've got to have five or 10 or 15 years. And you know, we, I'll tell you a quick story. So I've got a client, love this guy. He was my first client I ever engaged with where I was personally managing his wealth. And he's, uh, he lives in Vegas, still alive. He's in his early 90s. He and his wife were registered nurses. The most they ever made in one calendar year was less than 100 grand. Dual income. He's got 4 million bucks. He made less than 100 grand. How? Long-term investor. He put it in. He didn't worry about the ups and downs. He didn't worry about the negative markets. We live 80% of our lives roughly in bull markets and 20% in bear. But the bear markets hurt about 80% of the, the hurt compared to the bull. So it's a reversal, right? They say, you know, it takes 10 rights to make up for one wrong. Well, you get one bear market and it takes a generation sometimes to get out of that. And this guy just, you know, hard charging, put the money in, let it grow, average in, save every paycheck, and he ends up with four million bucks. And that's a beautiful scenario. So if I'm starting out today, um, the first thing I would say, and this is, you know, obviously folks here are predominantly in school, so you probably don't have a lot of income, but the first thing you have to do is pay yourself. You have to prioritize and pay yourself first. And, and when you think about that, there's a lot of things that need to be paid. Mortgage, car, utility bills, your Verizon bill for your cell phone. Like, there's a lot of things that have to be paid. And too often I hear people say, well, I, don't, I can't pay myself. And my response to that is, you choose not to pay yourself. A luxury once tasted becomes a necessity. YouTube TV for me is now a necessity. NFL package on Sunday, necessity. Is it really a necessity? No, it's a luxury that I've, been, I've become accustomed to. But if I start out my journey after school and I put the mindset, and this one's gonna scare you a little, the number should be 20%, not 10. You should be saving 20% of your income. All right, the 10% rule, if anybody's heard that, that assumes you have a pension, right? 6% approximately of the S&P 500 companies now offer a pension. So if you're working in the, in the private sector, don't expect a pension, which means the 10% savings rule is not enough. You gotta save 20. So if you start out your first job, my daughter did this last year, making 50 grand a year, and she sat with me and said, what do I do? I said, you need to figure out a budget that you can live on 40. That's where you have to start. You have to save 20% of your income. The people that do that are the ones that you see in retirement with $5 million. And people assume, well, they must have inherited it, or they're a trust fund baby, or they hit a lotto, right? They did some, none of that is true. 99% of our clients are self-made. And when you look at one common thread among all of them, it's that they paid themselves first. So that's where I would start. Um, it's not granular like, you know, would I buy GE over IBM? That's not the issue. It starts really fundamental, 30,000 foot view down is, I'm making money, what's important to my long-term financial health? It's savings. So that's where I would, that's where I would start. Thank you, thank you, Todd. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Um, a lot of people like your daughter will come and they'll make their first income and they don't know what to do with their money. When would you advise to get a financial advisor versus not? And what are some of the drawbacks of having a financial advisor? Yeah, well, th that's a good question, especially for young folks. And, and I'll start with this. Um, most advisors in the industry, there's about 300,000 of us, we are 100% commission. So if you think about being a financial advisor at Merrill Lynch, there's no sick pay, there's no vacation, there's no pension, um, you're a contractor. So that's great for the entrepreneurial spirit, but it's terrible for the starting out investor. And the reason is, if you come to me and you say, hey, I've got 10 grand, can you help me? The answer at Merrill is no. All right, we're 250,000 our minimum to start. Our average client's two and a half million. So I would struggle with that. If you go to a company that sells life insurance and annuities, 
the advisor, and I hate, to, I hate to be negative on this, but the advisor's first thought is, what's in it for me? Right? Micah, can I clip you for a 7% commission on a product that you don't really need? So at least I make 700 bucks out of this meeting? That's the way people think, and it's, it's bad, but that is the setup. So what I would start with, when you, when you hit the bid and you get that first job, by far, no question, your 401k. You start with your 401k. It's employer-sponsored, so there's no commission. It's negotiated, so the cost is low. It's payroll deduction, so it's seamless, right? You, you sign up and you say 10% year one. And what we, what we love to see people do is start out with 10 and then ratchet up 1% a year until they get to 20. It's low cost, seamless, like ready to roll and put it in something that is aggressive when you're young. Now, aggressive means more equity based than fixed income, more stock than bond. Why? Over the long run, Stocks beat bonds, bonds beat cash. That's the, that's the way it works. In the short run, last year, cash beat bonds and bonds beat stock. We literally flipped it on its head. But that is not the historical trend. The historical trend is stocks beat bonds, bonds beat cash. Do you want to be an owner, a lender, or a holder? You're holding cash, you're reserving. For 20 years, it's paid nothing. It's now paying 5%, which is nice, but it's been paying nothing. Do you want to be a lender? I'm going to lend you money and you're going to pay me 6% or do you want to be an owner? Well, if I've got a 20, 30, 40 year time frame, I absolutely want to be an owner. So you look for an S&P 500 or a broad-based index like the total U.S. stock market or what's very common these days in your 401k plans is what's known as target date funds. A target date fund is a commingled fund, so it could be an ETF or a mutual fund, which just means there's lots of stuff packaged into one deliverable, right? No, no different than going to a restaurant and you get your meal. You know, the, the, the wait, waiter or waitress doesn't tell you every ingredient in the meal. They just say, here's your chicken parm. And you say, great, I'm hungry. Um, that's what a target date fund is. It's a complete package. It gives you domestic, it gives you international, it gives you US small cap. And the longer out you go on the date, so right now they're rolling out 2065, is the longest dated target funds. When you think about when you're gonna retire, that's gonna default you to an almost all equity, all stock portfolio. And then the other thing is, uh, and let's just talk about this, you know, for the, for the younger folks in the room, a bear market is your best friend. You want a bear market. You want a bear market. Why? If I'm gonna commit, let's just say I'm gonna commit $1,000 a month when I've got my full-time job into my 401k. Do I wanna buy high or low? Low, right? I want everything on sale. And I don't want it on sale for a year, I want it on sale for a decade. Because I'm buying low, 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 and all of a sudden when the trampoline springs and I go up back towards the long-term averages, which are around 8%, I would love to buy low and put all those dollars in at cheaper prices and then see the high later on in life. So, Professor Stenard, myself, we're getting towards that point where we don't really want bear markets anymore. We're getting a little long in the tooth here, right? At 53, I'm not thrilled about a bear market, not to mention we get paid on what we manage. So when the market falls, our income goes down. But for the younger folks, you can't pick a better scenario than a recession to start your investing process. Because if the money's gonna go in there anyways, I might as well get it in there cheaper. I, I did a call um, with our clients during COVID. And I encouraged a lot of our clients, I said, look at your balance sheet, look at your kids, and if you can afford to make a gift to them, five grand, 10 grand, 15 grand, and get it in the market, your kids are gonna be very thankful. One of my favorite longtime clients who lives in Colorado calls me up the next day and says, I wanna open an IRA for my daughter. We put six grand in. The Dow is at 19,000. Today it's at 32. She's doubled her money with dividends. I mean, that's buying low. And it's in a Roth IRA, so it's invisible to the IRS for life. They'll never get a penny of it. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, most of us here are college students. Um, college from when you went to college can be a lot different from how it is today. What would you do that is the same or differently to reach the position you are in today? So you're spot on. Um, the world's gotten more complicated. 
right? I know this as, uh, you know, we're going to the Rangers game tomorrow. I'm hosting a bunch of clients in New York City at Madison Square Garden, and it takes me like 20 minutes to figure out how to download a ticket, right? It just does. I'm like, I don't know. And then I get frustrated, and I ask somebody in the office. The world's definitely gotten more complicated. What's not gotten more complicated is, and we were talking about this earlier, I think you and I were, is uh, the PhD. The PhD is pat passion, heart, and desire. That doesn't change. So yeah, the world's more complicated, it's more technical, but what you bring right here is what is gonna land you the right job, number one. There's no, there is no way hard work doesn't win. So when I think about today, I think number one, finance is an understudied major. Financial advisory, what I do, think about this, all right? I, my dream, by the way, and I wore it, here you see it, my New York Giants cufflinks were horrible. Uh, we were at the game on Sunday watching the worst heartbreaking loss in overtime ever. Uh, and talk about statistics, Giants had a 99.9 .9 probability of winning that game with 127 left in the fourth quarter, and they lost. So a one in a thousand shot, it can happen. Um, my dream was to be in the NFL, Lo would have loved it. That, there's a lot of people in very few spots. Financial advisor, most people don't wake up in the morning and dream of being a financial advisor. But think about the math. Every year, there are fewer and fewer advisors, and there are more and more millionaires. That is an incredible setup. So when I think about our, the next 10 years of my team and our career, there's more people that need help that are wealthy and there's less people delivering that help every single year. Our industry's old. Believe it or not, you're looking at me with that caricature, which makes me look younger than I am, but you look at me at 53, I'm one of the young guys at Merrill Lynch. Our average advisor at Merrill is 60. I mean. Who's going to take care of the next generation? So I think if I'm in college today, some things haven't changed. Finance is critically important. It's misunderstood. The industry is just hungry for hardworking people. You want to get a job? I was telling you earlier, my friend, what we look for. We look for passion, heart, and desire. Passion, heart, and desire. That's what we look for. I would rather hire a student athlete than a student. I would rather hire a student employee, someone who works, than just a student. I would rather hire somebody come out of Hudson Valley and SUNY Albany, like I did, that has passion, heart, desire, and the will to work than somebody coming out of Harvard with a 4.0. That, that's what they did. They went to Harvard. That's not the type of business we run. We need a business of hardworking, grinded out people that, you know, my one buddy in Maryland always says, we have a, by the way, we have a 95% failure rate in the industry doing what I do. Nine, not, 19 out of 20 don't make it. If you join a team and there's a bigger process, it's, it's different, but to truly do it on your own, 19 out of 20 advisors fail. And my one buddy always says, I've never seen anybody fail that turns the lights on and the lights off. Because what happens is that person gets noticed. Either they make it on their own, or somebody like me or somebody on my team goes, man, that guy or gal works really hard. They're in before me every day, and when I leave, they're still here. I want them. So that's, you know, what would I do differently in college? Or quite honestly, I wouldn't do anything differently. You know, I mean, I, you know, my kids go to Lemoyne uh, College in, in Syracuse, a bunch of them, and it's wonderful, and they get the experience. But, you know, being a commuter for four years and paying my own VIG, it, it gave me a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. And, you know, when I'm competing against other people, and I'm like, oh, you know, well, you didn't have to do that. Your path was a little easier. I use that as fire in the belly to win. And it's never gone away. I still carry a chip. You can't see it, but it's there. It's figurative, all right? But that, that's a big part of this, and when I sat in the seat you're in now for the students in the room, which is, you know, you could see them, I had no idea what the future held. I didn't know whether I'd make it or whether I'd be still working at the Desmond, pushing around tables and chairs and delivering shrimp. 20 years later, I had no idea. 
but hard work is irreplaceable. And if you do it, and you do it well, it gets noticed. Uh, and that's also your grades. You know, you don't need to be the 4.0 student. If you are, that's awesome. And that should be the target. But you can't be the 2.0 student. Because as an employer, if I'm looking at someone, what your GPA tells me is not how smart you are. That's only a small piece. It tells me what effort you put in. And if you come to me and you say, like me, very average high school student, but I made it here, and I ended up graduating summa cum laude at SUNY Albany, that was effort. That was not God-given ability. That was effort. And that's the kind of stuff we look for, and that's what employers are looking for today. Um, especially, you know, and, and Gen Z will be different. Right? And, you know, unfortunately, the millennials get a bad rap. They really do. The millennials get this rap of like, what's in it for me? You know, and uh, one, one thing I'll tell you too is, when you go for your first job, please don't ever, ever say to your potential employer, I value work-life balance. Oh my God, like, I'm, out, I'm already gone. I'm out the door. I haven't, I haven't told you yet, but you're done, right? Because what you're saying to me is, hey Todd, you got this team and you all work really hard and I'd like to be part of the success of your team, but I don't really wanna work that hard because I have different values than you. Really? Because you ain't getting hired, right? That is not how you get your job. I value work-life balance. I think it's crap. Um, you know what you say is, I value the ability and the opportunity to learn from other folks so I can work as hard, if not harder than them, to cut my own path and prove that I'm, I'm a worthy hire for you. Man, that's bells, I'm, bells are going off, and I'm like, ooh, I like that person. So, you know, just as, as, you, as you go through your life and your path, use the fact that you're here at Hudson Valley as a weapon, right? It's a superpower because your path is different from a lot of others, especially those on Wall Street. And you know, when I was growing up in the industry, and Joe would, would I'm sure, agree with this, the job everybody wanted was investment banker. Right, you work 80 hours a week, you make a million dollars a year, and in, you know, by the time you're 35, you're bald, which I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet, and you're exhausted, and you're like, all right, now I gotta do something else with my life because I've created this wealth. That was the job everybody wanted. You know what they all want now? Any thoughts? Financial advisor. I'm not kidding. The investment bankers want to do what I do. They're like, let's see. You set your own hours. You really don't report to anybody as long as you stay within the guide rails of, of the SEC rules and Merrill Lynch rules. You stay in that lane. You work with individuals. You provide advice and guidance to people and you help them shape their lives. I mean, that's what we do. This morning I was on a call with a longtime client and the conversation, she's 82, was does she sell the house in Massachusetts and move to an extended facility where she can continue to you know, live her life with lower cost and uh, you know, support and things around her or does she hang it out for another year or two? And what's the cost benefit of that? It wasn't a financial conversation, right? It was personal. That's a lot of what we do. The investment bankers now look at us and they're like, our business is investment banking, very cyclical. Markets are good, there's lots of IPOs, they're killing it. Last year, how many IPOs were there last year? You can count them on one hand. The investment banker stood around and did nothing waiting for a pink slip. That's not good. How about us last year? Markets in a free fall, clients are nervous. We had a busier year than we've had in 10. I mean, it was crazy busy. And it proved to a lot of people that they need advice, that they can't do it on their own. So I'm monologuing a little at you, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going off topic, but we'll move on to the next question. <laughs> Couldn't have said better. Uh, getting back more into the stock market, I think a lot for our generation is we're always bombarded with news. We spoke about Jim Cramer and all these things that happen every day with news and the stock market being, oh, this is happening today, this is happening tomorrow. Uh, how would you, for someone just getting started, where would you look for credible information and where would you look for information that wouldn't lead you and say, oh, a promised fund that gives you 30% when in reality it's just a scam or a pyramid scheme? Yeah, so uh, start with if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, number one. Number two, if there was a magic wand, we'd all have it, right? I mean, 
if I could predict what the market was going to do in the next 12 months, I wouldn't be working at Merrill Lynch managing money for clients. I'd be a bazillionaire on my own, right? And I'd, be, I'd have my own little shop, I'd, you know, call it whatever you want. So just start with fundamentals. Back to what we began with. Money doubles every 10 years. That's a fundamental statement that will probably hold true for the next 50 years. Start with that. If somebody's dangling something in front of you, if it's got some incredible tax benefit, it's probably a scam, right? The tax code is actually very simple. 90% of Americans don't even itemize anymore, which means their tax return is pretty straightforward. Um, if there's a, a vehicle or a product and it's not registered, go very, very cautiously. What I mean by that is, you know, if my next door neighbor comes to me and says, hey, I've got this idea, you know, we're gonna buy a bunch of dry cleaners and, you know, we're gonna roll them up into one big dry cleaner business and then we're gonna sell it to a bigger dry cleaner company. Um, that's a non-registered investment. My recourse is I could lose 100% of my value and I have no recourse. Additionally, I could be scammed. Right? And the guy could take my money and be like, hey, he went to the casino and hit double yellow or double green and lost it. And it's like, hey, you're out. So registered vehicles are better. That would be things like mutual funds, ETFs, individual stocks. Um, and also think about the bucket. And what I mean by that is where are you going to save your money? And this is an area that oftentimes gets missed. If I'm, if I'm a new investor, and I use the bucket of my 401k. There's pros and cons, right? My 401k is pre-tax. That's generally a pro. I'm putting dollars in before the IRS uh, is taking anything out or, or whatever state I live in. But it's also limited in that it's retirement money. I can't get it till I'm 59 and a half. If I'm going after tax, the benefit is I can get the money back when I want it, but I've got to earn it first. And then the question of, of where I mean, and you're, you're spot on. There is so much information. I mean, there's 24-7 feeds. Um, I think you start with companies like Vanguard. Low cost, structural, good, build core portfolios. You can look up a core allocation at BlackRock, at Vanguard, at Schwab, any of the discount brokers. You can use Merrill Edge. We at Merrill, Merrill Lynch has a whole kind of a, an online program. It's very inexpensive, free stock trades, very inexpensive for a portfolio that'll be structural and it rebalances. And you could put 10 grand in and have a fully diversified portfolio at virtually no cost. That's a great place to go. Where I would not go is all of the investor websites because oftentimes they're either promoting something that's beneficial to them or they're promoting eyeballs right, views, looks, and you know, I, I've said this for years. If I was a host on CNBC, CNBC's ratings would be absolutely horrible, <laughs> right? They'd be horrible. So they'd be like, all right, Todd, what do you think today? I'm like, well, I think long-term investing, core allocations, core and explore, core would be like S&P 500, or core would be the, you know, the equal weight S&P, which gives you all 500 stocks equally weighted. And then if you wanna explore, maybe, you know, nibble at some Amazon or some Apple, and they'd be like, all right, well, you said that yesterday. And you said it the day before, and you said it last year. And they're like, yep, that's it. That's all I got for you. I'd be so boring. You know what, though? I'm right. I'm 100% right. These guys and gals that are always talking about options, I'm trading this, and I'm going to buy this put in this call. I'm going to do a straddle. I'm gonna... You know what I hear? I hear Charlie Brown's teacher in the background. Wah, 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 wah. That's what I hear. Because I can't execute that. I don't know what I'm doing. The cost is extremely high. And the guy on TV is going to change his opinion tomorrow. And then I'm going to oh, well, wait a second. I thought, no, 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 do this. They need eyeballs. What we need as investors is wealth. That's what the goal is, right? I don't go to work every day just to pay the bills. I go to work to create wealth so that when I'm older, I don't have to go to work. And again, core, fundamental, so think about the solar system. The sun is enormous, right? And then you got the planets and moons, whatever that surrounds it. The sun is your core. That's your S&P 500, that's your broad-based small cap index, that's your EFI, your international index. That's your core. Everything around it is satellite. So again, if you say, I love Apple stock, and we like Apple, 
at this price. Um, it's not a recommendation, it's just a name we like. We like Amazon at this price. Um, you know, love ExxonMobil. I know that might be controversial among some, but it's probably the best run company in the world. Um, by the way, they're gonna be the leader in lithium, which is electric battery. Uh, Exxon's gonna suck salt water out of the core earth, not the ocean, and pull lithium out of it and push it back. I mean, it's phenomenal. So if you want to satellite a few companies around the core, that's awesome. And you should do that. But don't ever let the satellites become bigger than the core. And an example on it is, uh, who knows Square? Everybody knows Square, right? The, you know, Square stock, you go to the, the place, they swipe your card. Uh, we have someone that owns a lot of Square stock way too much. And when the stock was at 200 two years ago, I made a pretty strong push to sell some of it. Not all of it, but I said, listen, this is, this is becoming a very large portion of your net worth. It was over 50%. That, that gets egregious. And the recommendation is let's sell some periodically and diversify it a little bit. And the short answer back was no. I think Square is going up. 300, 400, and it's going to get acquired. And I said, well, I hope that would be the case. And if you had 20,000 shares a square at 200 bucks a share, you know, you got $4 million of stock. If you sold a million and it did go up, you'd still have $4 million of stock, maybe more. Wouldn't that be awesome? But you took a million off the table. And the client says, yeah, but I'm not selling any. Um, square closed yesterday at 39 from 200. Now, is there buyer's remorse or seller's remorse in that scenario? Absolutely. Why didn't the client sell it? They let emotion dictate their portfolio. And that's not ever a winning strategy. Emotion is your enemy. Uh, we, have, uh, we run something at Merrill called the Flow Show. And every Friday morning, we get a chart that shows investor sentiment. How do I feel about the market? And we survey thousands of people every week and say, how do you feel? And we give them ranges. And then we just put those just on a, you know, a scale of one to 10. And there's an arrow, a barometer. When the average investor feels 2.0 or lower on a scale of one to 10, that is extreme bearishness. Eight and above, extreme bullishness, everything else in the middle. The index on Friday last week was 1.5. That's extreme bearishness. That's where we are today. Why is that important? That indicator is the single best market timing indicator in history. And it's counterintuitive to what you feel. The worse you feel, the better time it is to invest, period. The index is at 1.5. How many people today are running out saying, God, I got this 5% money market, and maybe I'll sell that money market and buy a bunch of stocks with you know, multiple wars going on and potentially a government shutdown and all the stuff that's hitting us every single day. How many people feel like, wow, this would be a great time to be an investor, right? Probably not very many. And you know what's most likely going to happen is in the next 12 to 24 months, the market's gonna rip higher. That's what usually happens. Look at the indicators. So I hope that gives you some. Thank you. Well, Mr. Salika, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that it's easy to become misinformed and misguided when it comes to investing. When someone hears the term like uh, diamond hands, they might think, oh, diamonds, I need to be rich or something to invest. Or if I make one wrong investment, I'm going to have to go live on the streets. <laughs> so would you mind telling us what you think some of the biggest misinformations are that you've heard in your business or from clients and maybe how to get over them? Sure. Uh, first one is... How many people have heard the term Wall Street Casino? Everybody, right? It's not a casino. <laughs> it's just not. A casino is awesome if you're the owner. It's terrible if you're the player. Wall Street is awesome if you're the participant, meaning you're participating in ownership. Think about this. Most countries in the world, you do not have the opportunity to own the most iconic names in the world. All right, if I grow up in a, in a poor country, you know, somewhere, you know, pick your, pick your spot. I'm just getting internet. When I grow up here, I can buy ExxonMobil. I can buy Apple. I can be an owner of Apple. That is incredible in and of itself. So start with the opportunity set, which is, you know, 
we have the ability to be owners of the most iconic brands in the world, number one. Take it a step further. The biggest mistakes, I'll tell you a personal one that we did, which is if, if I just look at the statistics, remember what happened, most of you were not investors or, or probably even thinking about this stuff in 08, 09, but the, the great financial crisis was a true shock and awe moment for the industry. The market fell 52% peak to trough. Just think about that. If you're, if you're a saver and you've put 30 years of employment in, you worked at GE, and you're ready to hit the bid and call it, and you watched a million turn into 490,000, you are not happy. And the natural reaction is, I gotta do something. Right? If you put your hand on a hot stove, what do you do? You pull the hand off, right? Well, it's fight or flight. It's no different than finance. It's fight or flight. I get nervous. Oh my God, this is, and we had more people tell us the Dow's going to 5,000. Like it was, already, like it already happened, even though it hadn't. And the world's coming to an end. Um, you know, Wall Street's done. Stocks will never give positive return again. Like all these crazy statements that'll never come true. And yet, what did we do? Well, we got our clients to stay the course, but we did not rebalance into more risk assets. Why? No one would let us, with very few exceptions. And if I could roll back the hands of time, I would have been much firmer on that. That was a huge mistake. Um, I heard Chris Davis say at one time from Davis Funds in New York, he said, I dreamed of a time when the P.E. ratio in the market was in the single digits. Uh, we don't have time to go into the P.E. ratios, but historical average, 16 and a half. So if it was in the single digits, you're like three standard deviations from the mean. That's a really cheap market. And he said, I dreamed of a time when the P.E. was going to be single digits. And then when it happened, I hated every second of it. I did nothing. Why? Emotion, right? So that's the, the biggest caveat to investing is getting your, your feeling like you know what the outcome is going to be on something that you cannot predict the outcome. Right? Didn't Mark Twain have a famous quote that said, it's not, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so that gets you in trouble. And it's that false sense of confidence, like I know the market's going up or I know it's going down. You don't. And by the way, for all the ladies in the room, you're better at that than men, by far. Men have a much higher propensity to think they know what's going to happen than women, which is why many females are better investors than males. So you gotta check that at the door. What else, Joe? How's our time looking? questions from the audience, but I know that our uh, panel is, uh, well, we're all enjoying the conversation immensely. If you do have a question, please make your way over to this microphone and uh, you'll have a chance to, to uh, ask it so that everyone can hear it. The, um, excellent, excellent. All right. Sean Sampler. Hi, so first I wanted to just say thank you, um, but I heard that robo-advisors might be taking over the industry. I think that's something that many people have, have heard here. You're saying your industry is, is, is a growing business and it's what the uh, former investment bankers dream of. Um, but you also say that the main, or I would say that the main part of your job is um, to take the emotion out of the clients, right? Because that's the most dangerous thing. And um, would the robo-advisors, in, in your opinion, in your opinion, in the coming decades, help the clients take their emotions out of it? Or is that something that we'll always need a person for, like maybe doctors or psychologists? Yeah, it's a great question, because robos are clearly big and gaining steam every single day. There's nothing wrong with them, nothing at all. And for someone starting out, I think it's a great program. We have it at Merrill, uh, one of the top robo firms, one of the guys that runs it's one of my clients, believe it or not, and yet, where's all his money? It's with me. Which is, which is okay. Um, so I'm a fan of robo. Here's the problem. I think 10 years from now, we're going to look back and we're going to say, you know, the broad markets, let's say, earned 8% a year and the average robo investor earned 3 And that's what we're going to see. And I'll cite a quick Vanguard study. Vanguard did a study that said, what's the value of advice? It came out to 3.1% per annum, per year. And what we say in our industry is, Who's going to hold the hand of the widow, right? 
who has access to private equity, private real estate, private debt, hedge funds, long short strategies, managed futures, that's what we can bring to the table that robos can't. So I think they're actually complementary. And if you're doing a robo program, you got to stick with it. Don't do it and be like, oh, geez, I lost 20% last year. I'm out. That will be terrible. So I, I think there's absolutely room for both. But longer term, you know, the tax code is simpler, but the investing world is more complicated. Thank and there is a democratization right now of stuff that was usually only available for $50 million and up, like family offices and endowments that you can do at lower in income levels that is lights out that you need an advisor to have. So thanks for the question. Looks like we got a quick fire round coming up here. We got about four minutes and four people. So uh, let's go ahead. First of all, I want to say thank you. This has been a wonderful presentation so far. Um, and my question is, I would like you to comment about, I feel like this younger generation has an uh, attitude that trends towards, uh, they're not very uh, patient and they want to get rich quick. And I'd like you to comment on that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's not just the younger generation, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's every generation, you know? Listen, the lottery is the worst investment you can ever make. You get paid 50 cents on the dollar, and then you pay tax on that 50 cents. You keep 30 cents on the dollar. Yet, when the Powerball's a billion dollars, there's lines out the window. Why? Because people don't want to take the hard path. They want the easy path. That is natural. So, my encouragement is, when it comes to your finances, take the long road. It's worked for a thousand years. It'll work for the next thousand. And if you want to have fun and buy your Powerball ticket, buy a buck. You know, spend it. I hope you win it. If you do, call me. <laughs> Happy to help you with it. But I think you, you just have to eliminate that racetrack, casino, you know, meme stock mentality and go with the core. I just want to say, first of all, thank you for your time. And my main question is like, remember when you talked about the fire flight, like when you invested in like a million bucks, but then came about like 400,000 short? Like, is it better to like cut back on your loss or try to like manage like a new deal? So uh, the short answer typically is no. Now, if it's an individual stock, that's a different area because individual stocks can go to zero. Lehman Brothers, Enron, et cetera. When it comes to the market, the broad market, just use the S&P, it's the staple. The s and is not going to zero. 500 companies in the US that you all know and have in your pockets and shop online and do your Google searches and drive your cars, if they all go to zero, the end of the world has already happened, period. So no, when, when you lose money and you feel the worst about it, it's the time to buckle down and double down and do more. That's what the smartest investors have done historically, and that will continue. It's why the institutions win and the retail investor loses. Institutions have IPSs, investment policy statements, that say, here's what we're going to do, and we're not going to violate it. Individuals have emotions. The institutions always win. Be the institution. So is it like better to we'll let a couple oh, people go, and then we'll close it up. You can stick around this thing forever. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciated it, and I think that a lot of students, um, we don't really get to listen to you know people who have gone through it, and especially someone who came from the background, um, just coming back to you, your humble beginnings, and it, I really appreciate it. Um, I was wondering, I noticed how you said you know in, investing in S&P and stuff and diversifying that way. Um, if you did go towards an individual company, say like Chevron, for example, or something, mm -hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on companies like that that produce a dividend? Um, do you support companies like that, or you want you personally stay away from companies with the high dividends? No, so, so we love dividends. Uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about this. We love dividend growers, not dividend payers. And, and here's the distinction. A dividend payer, typically your telecoms, utilities, some of your automotives, when, if you bring in a dollar of profit and you spend that dollar on a dividend, you have no wiggle room to reinvest in your business and grow. If you think about a Microsoft, if they bring in a dollar of profit, their dividend's about 30 cents. That leaves them 70 cents to grow. So I would rather own Microsoft with a dividend yield of 1.5% than AT&T with a dividend yield of 7. Because what's going to happen is over time, Microsoft price is going to go like this, and AT&T's price is going to go like that. 
Chevron's a great company, by the way. Um, and they're, look, they're a dividend grower. Chevron has grown their dividend consistently and methodically over the years, and the stock price has gone up. Those are names we really like. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just curious, like, so I'm still, I've been investing since I was little, since I was like 12 years old. And I, like I t was telling you, like, mm -hmm. I've been always been into this stuff and like researching different charts and stuff. So I want to ask a question about specifically long term investing. So when you're making a portfolio, it could consist of penny stocks, mutual funds, bonds, high interest yielding accounts, your Roth IRA, all types of stuff. Anything that you have is considered an asset. That's what I was taught. So in order to n not just maximize profitability, but also to lower li liability, what are some good, what, what's, what, how do you, how, what, okay, I'm about to say before. But like, how do you like bestly diversify your account percentage wise mm -hmm. so that you could be the, the, the highest income yield? Sure. It, it, Antonio, we were chatting earlier. I love the question. I want you to visualize, and I'll be quick, Joe. I want you to visualize three buckets. A small one on the left, a small one on the right, and a big one in the middle. Your left bucket is your no-risk bucket. That's your house. That's a CD at the bank. That's a money market fund. That's something that doesn't carry risk. All right? There's a reason. Think about it. That's your small bucket. Your bucket on the right is your aspirational bucket. It's also small. Aspirational means I'm going to commit dollars to an investment vehicle that is clearly speculative or risky, but the reason I'm doing it is I think it will have a better return than the big bucket in the middle. So example would be, and this is more for somebody who's older as opposed to younger when you think about it because your buckets are going to change size over time, but somebody who says I've got the bucket on the left, that's my house. Well, what do I do? I pay down my mortgage. I try to be smart about my debt. Ultimately, when I retire, no debt is the answer, by the way. You know, mortgages are barely deductible anymore, so don't get into that realm. You are paying the bank an interest rate, and there's a carrying cost for that. So I want to pay that down, and I have a reserve. My bucket on the right might own something like a private placement investment, an options account. Uh, it could be a concentrated stock like Chevron, you know, or I might say I'm going to put 10% of my wealth in Chevron, cap it at that. And then the big bucket in the middle is your allocation. And what you want to do ultimately is if you win in the aspirational, you funnel that money back. And when you're winning on the low risk bucket, which is your cash, as your income comes in, you're funneling that money. So you got two buckets that are small funneling that big bucket in the middle. Money comes in, it goes in my 401k. I win on Chevron, it goes in my 401k or it goes into my regular core account. And I take these two buckets like a waterfall and the water just keeps pouring in and that big bucket keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the middle. That's my core portfolio. And then when you get people like, you know, a client who retires with a couple million dollars and they're drawing 5% on it, I got to tell you, you know, everybody in this room can retire with 5 million bucks. Save the right way. You don't need to make a million dollars a year. You can all retire with 5 million bucks. And if you do and you draw 5% on it, that's a quarter million dollars of income coming in per year without touching the principal. That is beauty. It's a lot of our clients, and you can all be there, too, 30, 40 years from now. Excellent. Big hand uh, for Todd Salika, my friend and a friend to the whole college. So we uh, uh, thank everyone who uh, joined us on live stream and, of course, those in person. If you're here in person, make sure you grab some refreshments that were supplied by the foundation. They're out there. They're for you. Go ahead and uh, make sure that we don't have to take any of those back to the foundation. We also <laughs> thank the Alumni Association for uh, what, they, what they are. We, uh, we, you're all going to be alum at some point, and we, uh, hopefully when you are successful, you come on back and we can hear your voice at the next Voices seminar. Until then, come to the Investment Club on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. in Admin 101. Uh, then uh, we, we meet every Wednesday. We talk about all sorts of things and, and help one another to become uh, more aware of personal finance and investing and how to succeed in so many different ways. It's a great club. We love it, and we'd love for you to join us. Thank you once again. Take care. Thanks, guys.